Prince Albert Victor, known affectionately as Eddie, stood on the brink of greatness as the heir to the British throne during the zenith of the Victorian era. Born into a world where the sun never set on the British Empire, Eddie's life was a tapestry of privilege, burdened with the weighty expectations of a future king. Yet, beneath the golden veneer of royalty lay a trail of scandals, whispers of indiscretions, and the tarnishing specter of his alleged connections to the darkest figure of the age, Jack the Ripper. Despite his royal lineage and the aura of a burgeoning monarch, Eddie's narrative was one of human frailty, marked by rumors and the ruthless destruction of his character. Thrust into the public eye, his every move scrutinized, Eddie's story is a poignant exploration of how the pressures of royal expectations and societal norms can sculpt and ultimately undo a prince. His tale is interwoven with tales of potential love interests that scandalize the nation, friendships that defied the rigid norms of his time, and a life cut tragically short before he could either fulfill or falter under his royal destiny. This video delves into the life of a prince who might have been king, exploring the complex interplay of royalty, reputation, and rumor. Was Prince Eddie simply a product of his environment? Or was there more to his story, shadowed by the infamous label of a suspect in the grisliest of crimes? Join us as we unravel the life and legacy of Britain's lost king, a man who embodies the eternal question of what if, and whose story challenges the boundaries between myth and monarchy. Born two months premature in 1864, Prince Albert Victor, affectionately dubbed Eddie by his kin, was the first son of Edward Bertie, Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII, and his consort, Alexandra of Denmark. Queen Victoria, just 45, was at the height of her reign. However, her beloved consort, Albert, had recently died, and the young child took on his name. He stood as the heir presumptive to the resplendent crown of the United Kingdom. In an era when the British Empire, in its majestic zenith, held dominion over vast swathes of the globe, the prospects for Prince Eddie shimmered with unparalleled brilliance. Endowed with an arresting visage, tall, dark, and undeniably handsome, Eddie was also celebrated for his amiable and benevolent nature. His brother George was born a short time later, followed by several sisters. Eddie was just six when he had his first brush with scandal as his father was forced to give evidence in the divorce of one of his mistresses. Victoria, tired of her son's philandering, wanted the children watched over by someone with a stricter hand, and she appointed the Reverend John Dalton, an ambitious man who was not a teacher. He created a rigorous schedule for the boys, and both Eddie and George found him exceedingly dull. Perhaps to cover up for his own shortcomings, Dalton called Eddie apathetic with an abnormally dormant condition of mind. Dalton's words have been used as gospel throughout the years to criticize the now infamous Eddie. But in letters, he was usually critical of the young George's commitment to learning as well. However, years later, when George was king and Eddie was dead, Dalton gave interviews to biographers speaking of how he had molded the young George's mind who he now called astute and engaging. At 13, most of Eddie's peers would be attending public school, but Eddie and George were sent to sea with the Reverend Dalton in tow as sea cadets. At the time, it was believed nautical training was the way to train monarchs. The two boys and their tutor spent the next five years at sea. In the summer of 1879, Eddie met the Prince of Wales' new mistress, Lily Langtree, whose face was all over England and developed a childhood crush on her after she gave him a trinket. Eddie would fall in love fast and often have his heart broken. In 1881, the two boys toured Australia and were greeted by large crowds everywhere they went. It seemed Eddie had a light and common touch with people and outshined George at all events. The journey had brought the brothers closer than ever and in Japan, they got matching tattoos. But in 1883, they were finally parted as Eddie was to attend Cambridge, the first prince ever to do so, and George was to stay in the Navy. A decision was made for Eddie to attend university, a tenure mercifully exempt from the rigors of examinations. His years at Trinity College, Cambridge, emerged as some of the most liberating and joyous of his life. Released from the oppressive constraints of royal expectations, he began to thrive. 
His new mentor, James Kenneth Jem Stephen, a vibrant academic and poet, only slightly Eddie's senior, quickly recognized that the prince was far from intellectually deficient. He saw in Eddie a deep-seated kindness and an empathic nature, essential traits for a sovereign in a constitutional monarchy. Jem devoted himself to cultivating Eddie's potential, expanding his intellect through exposure to literature and poetry, and, most crucially, through interactions with intellectually robust circles, vastly different from the insular hunting and shooting environment that had previously encapsulated his royal upbringing. Though Jem also did not believe Eddie would gain much benefit from studying, he saw in the young prince a charisma and kindness that later biographers ignored. At Cambridge, Eddie was encouraged to acknowledge his own worth and to forge the first nebulous outlines of his personal identity. Amid this transformative phase, he formed an intense friendship with his tutor. Whether it transcended into a physical relationship remains a matter of speculation, but it's undeniable that Eddie now mingled within sophisticated liberal circles that included many homosexual men. Cambridge at that time was the home of the new aesthetic movement, the cult of Greek love and pleasure for pleasure's sake, and here he acquired a reputation for sexual ambiguity. As with many in his class, he attended transvestite clubs. It is almost certain that Eddie, along with many of the boys in his class, engaged in acts of homosexuality. Additionally, he developed gonorrhea, much to the chagrin of his father. By this juncture, the prince had blossomed into an extraordinarily handsome young man. Fortuitously, he had inherited the exquisite features of his beautiful mother, rather than the more pronounced, bulbous characteristics typical of his father's lineage. He possessed a swan-like neck and a full-lipped mouth. For Eddie, whose self-esteem had always been tenuous, this became yet another avenue for self-affirmation, and he embraced it with zeal. This aesthetic self-expression not only aligned him with the fashion icons of his day, but also provided a much-needed bolster to his fragile sense of self, offering him a tangible way to validate his presence in an otherwise scrutinizing world. Modern historians remain sharply divided over the nuances of Eddie's sexuality. While some assert that there is no definitive evidence to classify the prince as anything but heterosexual, others suggest a more complex narrative. It is undeniable that the archival silence on Eddie's sexual orientation does not conclusively denote heterosexuality. Indeed, what earlier authors cautiously and ambiguously described as Eddie's dissipations likely extended beyond the typical vices, drinking, gambling, and heterosexual escapades common to young men of his aristocratic milieu. Such behaviors, rife among his peers, would scarcely have provoked any consternation, least of all from his own notoriously libertine father. While heterosexual affairs were tolerated, homosexual relationships most certainly were not. In the late 1880s, he had fallen in love with his cousin, Princess Alecky of Hesse, and often wrote to Louis of Battenberg about her, confessing his feelings, though she remained coy about the match. Victoria was determined the two should be married, calling Eddie the greatest catch in Europe. However, soon a scandal would emerge that would forever tarnish Eddie's reputation. The tribulations surrounding Eddie culminated with the notorious Cleveland Street Scandal of 1889. It all began at post office headquarters when 15-year-old Charlie Swinsco was found with 18 shillings three times his weekly wage. He was suspected of theft and soon admitted that he was paid for sex with a gentleman. Other boys were interviewed and it soon emerged that number 19 Cleveland Street was a house of male prostitution. You could go there and a young boy would be provided for you. Scotland Yard was told to clean up Cleveland Street and it became a higher priority than even the case of Jack the Ripper, which was occurring at that time. MPs and Lords were all found to be engaging in the activity. Lord Arthur Somerset, an equerry to the Prince of Wales, was significantly implicated in the Cleveland Street scandal of 1889. His solicitor said that if he were indicted, then he would name someone of much higher rank than him. 
and included the initials PAV in his letters. This was understood by the monarchy to mean Prince Albert Victor. While it has never been determined if the prince was involved, Somerset was allowed to leave the country and not charged, and all of the information was kept out of the press. The post boys, however, were all given short prison sentences. The prince who was in India at the time seemed blissfully unaware of the scandal. In his letters, his main concern is why Alecky had turned down his proposal. In fact, on a trip to Russia, she had met the dashing Nicholas and fallen in love. They would marry a short time later, and Alexandra would become the last empress of Russia, meeting a grim fate with her family in a cellar in Yekaterinburg. Whether Lord Arthur Somerset fabricated his defense to save himself, or Prince Albert Victor, really frequented the male brothel has never been conclusively established. Yet this ambiguity further ignited monstrous claims that would tarnish Eddie's reputation long after his demise. Over the decades, countless articles have sparked heated debates among historians and writers, arguing either for a potential institutional cover-up of his involvement or his absolute innocence. Looking back from the 21st century, these historical controversies may appear remote and less urgent. Nevertheless, as the saying goes, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Despite the British press concealing Eddie's alleged ties, the scandal loomed large enough for the New York Times to speculate that the wayward Prince Albert Victor might never ascend to the British throne. After the scandal, the Prince of Wales was adamant that his son should marry quickly, thus drawing up a list of potential brides. Soon after, Prince Eddie became enamored with Ellen, the daughter of the Comte de Paris, Duke of Orleans. This union was fraught with diplomatic tensions, as Ellen was Catholic and French, and related to a former pretender to the French throne, elements that presented substantial obstacles for a predominantly Protestant country. Even though Queen Victoria seemed supportive of Eddie's choice, the Prime Minister staunchly opposed it. At one point, Eddie was so besotted that he threatened to renounce his claim to the throne for her love, but opposition from her father and a failed appeal to the Pope ended their courtship, leaving both heartbroken. Following the debacle with Ellen, Prince Eddie turned his affections to Sybil Erskine, a member of the British aristocracy and a maid of honor to Queen Victoria. Despite her noble standing, Sybil's lineage and position did not meet the stringent criteria traditionally expected of a royal consort, intended to be of royal or at least high noble descent. Amidst Eddie's lingering scandals, there was a pronounced royal effort to restore his image through an advantageous marriage. Given these complexities, despite Eddie's genuine affection for Sybil, the union was deemed unsuitable by the monarchy. An exasperated Prince of Wales warned Eddie that failing to secure an appropriate match could result in his exile to the colonies. Consequently, his mother intervened and a more acceptable bride was sought. By late 1891, the royal family compelled Eddie to engage Mary of Teck, a minor princess with connections to both British and German royalty. Mary was a great-granddaughter of King George III through her mother, Princess Mary Adelaide of Cambridge, which provided her with a firm standing within the British aristocracy, though she was raised in Germany. Despite the apparent disparities in their personalities, with Mary often described as reserved and scholarly, Queen Victoria believed she could bring stability to his turbulent life. Contrary to expectations, the pair developed a rapport, and a wedding was swiftly scheduled for February 1892. Simultaneously, the government proposed Eddie for the ceremonial role of Viceroy of Ireland, a move intended to appease rising tensions in the region. In a reflective letter to his cousin Louis, Eddie expressed surprise at his own decision, noting, I wonder if you were surprised I was engaged, and I must say I made up my mind rather suddenly, which I think was the best thing, as it really is time I am getting married, well, if I am ever to be. This sudden determination highlighted a pivotal moment in his life, marking a transition towards royal responsibilities and away from the youthful indiscretions that had so defined his earlier years. The couple relished two weeks in London, 
immersing themselves in shopping and theater outings, where they were met with enthusiastic cheers from the crowds at every turn. Everywhere Eddie went, the people loved him. Tragically, on January 7, 1892, just one day before his 28th birthday, Prince Albert Victor fell ill with a cold that quickly escalated into the flu, causing him to miss his own birthday celebration. The illness rapidly worsened to pneumonia, and within a week, to the profound dismay of his family, Eddie succumbed, his life claimed by the same influenza epidemic that devastated countless others that harsh winter. Bertie, the Prince of Wales, who had often been stern with his elder son, was reportedly overwhelmed with grief at the funeral. It is said that he kept a portrait of Eddie above his bed for the rest of his life, a poignant reminder of the son he had prematurely lost. In a gesture mirroring the somber practices of Queen Victoria, his devoted mother, Alexandra, preserved the room where Eddie died as a lasting shrine. Eddie's personal items, such as his hairbrushes, shaving kit, and even a perpetually burning fire in the grate, were left undisturbed, as if in anticipation of his return. His fiancée, Princess May, was left a widow in sentiment before ever becoming a wife. The general populace, deeply shaken and saddened by the premature end of such a promising young life, mourned their lost prince profoundly. Bells tolled across Britain, shops and theaters closed their doors in mourning. The customary tributes flowed freely. However, a prevalent sentiment within the establishment, and one that history seems to affirm, is that Prince Eddie's demise, though tragic, fortuitously cleared the path for his younger brother. Though perhaps less charismatic, George was deemed a safer and more stable choice for the monarchy. Eighteen months after Eddie's death, George married Princess May, who became the formidable Queen Mary, stepping into the role once destined for his brother. Prince Albert Victor lies in St. George's Chapel, Windsor, in a grave resplendently adorned, yet somewhat isolated from the main church where most of his family rests. Many tourists who pass by his tomb remain oblivious to his identity and the legacy that could have been. His reputation, posthumously marred first by whispers of the Cleveland Street scandal and later by salacious links to Jack the Ripper, deteriorated over time. These latter accusations originated from a British historian in the 1970s whose sole evidence hinged on Eddie's reputed sexual deviance and his hunting skills, suggesting he knew how to disembowel birds. Despite the shaky foundations of these claims, they have been sensationalized in numerous books and films, including the Hollywood movie From Hell, which portrayed Eddie at the center of the Jack the Ripper scandal, where the royal physician was murdering women to protect the monarchy. This stems from a BBC documentary in the 1980s, featuring a man claiming to be the illegitimate son of Prince Eddie, alleging that while Eddie was not Jack the Ripper, he was indirectly responsible for the crimes to cover up a secret pregnancy. Such dramatizations, though lacking substantial evidence, have captivated audiences, perpetuating a narrative that, while intriguing, distorts the historical figure's true nature. Reflecting on what Eddie might have achieved as a monarch invites a tantalizing vision of an alternative history. His father, King Edward, ascended the throne amid modest expectations, yet proved to be a highly effective monarch. Could Eddie, often unfairly dismissed, have mirrored his father's success? His character, described as kind-hearted and affable, might have had a significant impact on international relations during the precarious years leading up to the Great War. It is also conceivable that he would not have abandoned the Romanovs in their darkest hour, unlike his brother, King George. Perhaps had fate dealt him a different hand, Alecky, the woman he once loved, would have spent her twilight years in the tranquility of an English country estate. Eddie's life remains one of history's poignant what-ifs. Rather than relegating his memory to the shadows of history as fortunate for not ascending to the throne, it may be more apt to mourn the lost potential of a reign that could have been marked by promise and compassion. In the correspondence that survives, Eddie appears as an eager, emotional man, striving to fulfill the expectations of his parents. Yet, we will never truly know the king he might have been or validate the veracity of the rumors that have clouded his legacy.
What are your thoughts on Prince Eddie? Would he have been a capable monarch? Why does he remain a lesser known figure in the monarchy? Does he deserve his scandalous reputation? Why is he so often linked to the Ripper scandal in modern day? Please share your thoughts in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching. And for those of you who ask, the scandalous life of Margaret the Duchess of Argyle will be in September. So click the bell icon to stay notified.